All right, let's go ahead and get started this morning. Uh, this morning, uh, grand rounds are being presented uh, by Dr. Jason Adelot, uh, who is an associate professor in the Department of Surgery uh, in the Division of Trauma and Emergency Surgery. Let's go. Uh, Dr. Adelot uh, grew up in Texas, I guess Katy, Texas, uh, then attended Texas uh, A&M and uh, this medical school. Uh, did his uh, general surgery residency uh, in the Army, and his last assignment uh, was uh, five or six years at uh, Walter Reed. Uh, during that time, I know he had been uh, deployed twice to Afghanistan, Iraq. to Iraq. Uh, and then we were able to uh, successfully uh, recruit him here on the faculty. And this morning, he's going to talk about uh, innovations in medicine and how to protect your own patented ideas. Dr. Adelot. Thank you. Well, I don't have a mic, but you probably won't need it. Well, okay. We've turned it on. Is there a way to turn that mic on? Can you all hear me? How about that? Does it say instructor? You should be okay. Do you have the mic itself? Yeah. Can I check it real quick? There you go. Okay, thank you, everyone. So, the reason I'm presenting this is because, uh, oh yeah, it's working too bad. The reason I'm presenting it is because uh, I, I have kind of an interest in innovating and inventing things, and I never really quite knew how to do it. I did it once on my own, and that was really quite painful. Well, it was neat, but painful. And then, since I've been here, I've did a couple things with another couple in the hopper, and uh, I realized that a lot of people don't know how to do it. A lot of people come up with great ideas, but they don't really realize that the university has a machine in place to help them, and kind of what, in general, that kind of means. So uh, I thought it would be a neat thing to give you all a, a little introduction on how that works. So this really is about innovation in general. It's not so much about innovation in medicine, although we'll cover it, but innovation in general and how uh, innovative thought can not just be about a little invention, but about thinking about inventions. I mean, obviously, this quote uh, really surpassed this person's expectations. The important part is that he was the chairman at the time. Uh, he didn't really have much vision. Uh, like this. We'll see more quotes. Okay, so this brings me to Ferris Bueller's Day Off. And I, uh, I know that y'all are probably looking at me and thinking about where I'm going to go with Ferris Bueller's Day Off, but does anybody here not named Dent know what this movie's about? Anybody? <clears throat> okay, John Hughes wrote this movie. Uh, any of y'all been to the Chicago Institute of Art? and seen this Surratt. So John Hughes wrote this entire movie one day when he was sitting there looking at this Surratt. And if y'all remember, I bet once I flash this picture up, you remember this scene where Cameron is looking at it and then it's an alternating shot of closer and closer and closer views of the Surratt. And he sees what Surratt painted in what was called pointillism, where he, it, you, the closer and closer you got to it, the less and less you saw of the big picture, and the more you just saw of his little points, right? Well, the whole movie's about Cameron, actually. This whole movie is about Cameron's dad. Actually, you never see him. But it, he ends up being one of the more feared and hated people in American history, really, over like the 1980s and 90s, nobody likes Cameron's dad. I mean, you can't find one person who does. But the movie's about him, and this scene really sums up the movie because as you look closer and closer to this picture, you just see the pointillism that 
is in the Surat. But if you look at the picture, Cameron is looking at a woman walking with her daughter, and it's a relatively tender scene, right? It's a person walking with their child in a park. We all sort of take it for granted, but Cameron didn't. Cameron was looking at that, and the closer and closer he looked at it, the less he understood, because Cameron didn't have parents like that. It's really sad. It's a really sad movie, just to let you know. Camp Ferris and all that is just comic relief. But the movie's about him and about the way parents treat their children and really the excess of the late 70s and early 1980s and how it became more important your work than your kids. So I'm sorry to bum everybody out about Ferris Bueller's Day Off. We'll get back to inventing and the American dream, right? To invent something and make it happen for you and make millions of bucks. I mean, anybody not want to do that? I do. I mean, I would love to make money while I'm sleeping. And do whatever it is you want to do that makes you happy, but it'd certainly be nice to do whatever you want to do that makes you happy and have a vineyard in Napa. That'd be pretty good. I'll take it. And so this is about the American dream, how to sort of at least get it started to make it happen. Any of y'all recognize these two names, these two guys? Spencer Silver and Art Fry? Anyone? Okay. <clears throat> so the guy on your left, on the screen's right, Spencer Silver is an engineer at 3M. He was working for about six years and developed a little, uh, a, a bunch of acrylic spheres that were uh, microscopic. And what they did is they existed in a certain way to where it became an adhesive that you could take things on and off of, like at, at will. Like as much as you wanted, it would just come on and off, on and off, on and off. He thought it was the greatest thing ever. And no one, even at 3M, thought it was a good idea. He presented it year after year after year. He looked for a way to make it happen. It never happened. Until this guy came along, Art Fry, uh, who was interning from University of Minnesota at 3M. And he also, at the time, was singing in the church choir. And his bookmarks kept falling out of the hymnal. He would mark the page and he would turn it. And it he couldn't figure it out. And one day he was having lunch with this guy. And uh, probably y'all have pieced it together by now by the background, but they invented the post-it note. I mean, one of the greatest American inventions really in the past 30 years, these guys did. And they did it because they happened to be eating lunch together one day. And I, I tried to look up how much post-it note has made 3M. And uh, I don't know. They didn't really disclose it. Uh, what they do disclose in 3M is incredible out of it. If you go to their website and actually go to the Post-it Note website, it talks about all the history and how they do business. And 3M really encourages inventions and innovation within their organization. And I think both these guys are like multi, multi, multi millionaires. Uh, yeah. So this was uh, the maker of computer boards, essentially. Compaq ended up buying them in the 90s. But yeah, yeah, he was also kind of a leader in that field and really kind of missed the ball. This is a, a really famous quote in the software computer industry, by the way. Incidentally, any of y'all know what the most lucrative American patent is in history? Venture a guess. Someone said the telephone. I'll tell you it's not the telephone. Anybody? Velcro. Velcro, great guess, no. <clears throat> it's Lipitor. Mm -hmm. Lipitor. Over the course of the patent, Pfizer made, anyone want to guess? $105 billion off of Lipitor. $105 with a B billion dollars during the patent's life. The patent ran out in 2011, and it really, there's a lot of discussion about Lipitor and Pfizer's patent, and is that the end of super drugs? Uh, nobody really knows. I just thought that was fascinating and doing for this, I was interested. I thought it was going to be telephone, television, something. Actually, the market at the time uh, wasn't such that they could qualify. Brings us to, we were discussing before a lot of you came in at 7, when y'all came in at like 7.06. Uh, we, uh, we were discussing what probably is the greatest American medical invention or the greatest worldwide medical invention in the past half century. 
and that's the stent. And Julio Palmaz, for those of you who don't know, invented that stent while he was here. I mean, it's hard to really quantify the millions and millions of lives saved and years saved off of people's lives because of this. I mean, I, I bet it's, I guess it's quantifiable, but it's like exponential math and derivatives. But uh, it, it's a fascinating story, and I really tried to interview him for this talk, but I, I could never get a hold of his schedule, and hopefully maybe we'll get another talk in another year. But it's really a black eye to the university. If those of you who don't know, uh, I tried to get a copy of this, but they wouldn't give it to me. Uh, there's a letter that says, uh, thanks for submitting your idea, Dr. Palmas. No, thank you. We're not interested. From the university. Uh, it's, it's not uh, the greatest moment in their history, but as we'll see later, it really changed the way uh, really, the University of Texas system, but certainly our institution, looks at innovation and intellectual property. Uh, I tried to work some quick estimates on this. Had the university had not said no thank you, well, who knows how the negotiations for the patent rights would have gone. But had they not said no thank you and the negotiation had gone the same way, you're looking at the university share in the 200 to 250 million per year type of neighborhood. Dollars, American. <laughs> it's a kind of a black eye. Even on Ryan Gosling, it's a black eye. So let's kind of get to the nitty gritty, right? How you patent something, how you make money from it. Forgive me if this is really rudimentary to a lot of y'all. Uh, it was not rudimentary to me when I first started in this kind of business. So you, you hatch an idea, you think up something. Then you sketch it down. And you, you, you put it down on paper so that you can at least put some kind of two-dimensional concept to what you're thinking about in three dimensions. I asked Dr. Pastana, did you ever invent anything? And surprisingly, he told me no. I, my guess is he's still got a few years left to invent something. The way he draws, I can't believe it. But you draw something out, and then you have to protect your idea. Protecting your idea will cover a little bit, but believe it or not, it's not the most important thing, but it's very important. Then you need to build a prototype. Then you need to license your idea. I say it that way because most doctors and most people, really, who invent something don't have the wherewithal to put the machine together to, to make widgets and sell millions of them. So you, you essentially license that idea to a company. And the company buys that from you, and they pay you. Everyone will love this. I will give you $4 million straight up for this idea. Yes, take it. Or, alternatively, I'll give you a little bit of money, but then I'll give you a cut. Or better yet, I'll give you a whole lot of money and a cut. How about that? But that's what licensing means, broad strokes. They then make the products, and then people are helped, and money is made. Uh, serendipity falls into this in some way. Um, I apologize if serendipity is too cliche for many of you to kind of agree with, but it's true. Things kind of fall into place. Had Silver and Fry never had lunch together, what would have happened? I mean, someone would have invented the post-it note by now, right? I mean, you would think, but things have to fall into place in a certain way. Call it karma or whatever. Something has got to happen that changes the way things are looked at from one perspective to another. And then the next thing you know, things kick off. So uh, I did an interview uh, with a man, we'll cover it in a minute, and he talks at length about the difference between the way humans and technology exist in the same environment. Technology exists to serve us. And technology being anything, an eraser on the end of a pencil, or a computer software program. And those things exist to help humans. We're the tiger. The technology is not the tiger. We're the tiger on the boat. You do what we want to say. <clears throat> but so many times we kind of find ourselves slaves to it, right? Uh, d whatever it may be, I, I know that oh, it's easy for you all to wrap your mind around Sunrise or any other computer program. You're a slave to that. Well, no, you're not. The technology is a slave to you. 
And sometimes when technology takes over uh, and you find yourself in that inverse relationship, there's a hard period there while you make changes. And really it drives humans. Humans are awesome at becoming like a rat in a cage. It drives us into somewhere where we have no other way out than the idea that we have to destroy the technology and make something better. And I just need to use this picture. <clears throat> so you hatch an idea. Um, it, it, sometimes it's out of necessity, sometimes it's out of convenience. Um, it, it's something that you just you can't stand anymore. You have to write it down and you have to get something made. Uh, I didn't want to bring one of mine in here, but okay. So peg tubes being pulled out of people is a problem, right? I mean, it's a bad problem. Uh, it costs the United States of America roughly uh, $100 million a year, peg tubes being inadvertently pulled out, $100 million. I mean, I know that's like a large number. You wouldn't really think about it, but it's true. We place about a quarter million of a year, and um, it costs quite a bit of money to repair all the ones that inadvertently get pulled out. And that repair goes from the annoyance of having to bring in grandpa from the nursing home to the emergency department, and then we see them. I mean, how many concepts have we seen like that in a month, right? Well, he pulled his bag out. Okay, well, we put a Foley in, she's been gastrographed, and then on and on and on it goes. It costs a lot of money, actually, and that's an annoying one. Nothing really bad happened, right? Nothing happened to grandpa. And then every major institution sees about one peg catastrophe a year. That is, I pull it out and actually it sits in the peritoneal space and no one really knew it and belly full of tube feeds. Or worse yet, it sits in the subcutaneous space, we infuse a bunch of tube feeds and gigantic necrotizing infection death. Right? Happens at every place in America. Not well reported. <clears throat> well, that's a problem and it's naggy and I don't really, it's such a bad problem. How come you can't just chop off the peg tube right at the skin and put a connector in each side and then it breaks apart? Well, and then the worst that happens is tube feed goes all over grandpa and gastric juice goes all over the bed and you have to wash the sheets, but it falls apart. Nothing bad happens. The university is patenting this for us. So it's a nagging idea and y'all need to take your nagging ideas. There's going to be somebody, sorry, in that side of the room it's going to have some nagging idea. It's a medical student. And it's going to be something. And all of a sudden, it's going to cure cancer. I don't know what it's going to do. Good luck, whatever it is y'all do. But it's going to be something. They're going to figure it out. Fogarty invented the Fogarty catheter when he was a medical student. Patented it when he was a medical student. It's going to happen. All of innovation and the way we think about medical innovation is changing. We'll cover it in a moment. So this comes to my interview. Any of y'all recognize this guy? This is Jack Pacey. Uh, I'll talk about what he invented in just a second, but he's a surgeon in Canada. I got the picture on your left, screen's right, off the internet. I, I Googled him and got a picture off the internet. That's him. But when I interviewed him, I said, hey, sir, your story is really interesting. Will you send me a picture of yourself? And he knew he was sending it to another surgeon, and that's the picture one surgeon sends to another of, this is a picture of myself, which I thought was really apropos. I thought it was great. So he, he wanted to do appendectomies in the emergency department. He wanted to uh, be able to do it under local, make an incision, stick an instrument in there, and then take the appendix out kind of laparoscopically, but not really, and, and then people would be gone in 15 minutes. That's what he wanted to do. So he draws out his thing. There's a handle. It's a retractor. Uh, at the end of the tractor is a light source and a fiber optic lens. He was going to do this. And he did. He invented it. He had a workshop in his garage, and sure enough, he takes this retractor, he bends it, and he puts uh, a light source at the end of it and a fiber optic lens. He hooks it up to cameras and a computer screen where he can see. And he actually started using this thing more and more and more on pigs, obviously, but not just to do uh, appendectomies, but he wanted to be able to operate in the pelvis and be able to see. So he, he not only wanted to use it for one application, he wanted to use it for another. And this is a picture of him in a pig's chest. 
he, he was talking to me at length about it. And he says, oh, and you can look behind the heart and you can see the esophagus if you ever had to operate back there. And he kept toying and toying and toying with this idea. We'll get to him in a minute. So you jot something down and it's something that feels great to you. Great. Now it's time for you to protect your idea. And the reason you need to protect your idea is not because if you have a patent, nobody else can make it. Oh, no. Just look at China. They can make whatever they want. But selling it in the United States and not having some gigantic WAP come on them uh, is a problem. Samsung and Apple. Any of y'all not know the story of Samsung and Apple? Mm -hmm. Yeah, Samsung thought they would get a little around that and thought that they would... And Samsung is a Korean company. But they thought they'd be able to get around some of the iPhone and, and Apple's touchscreen technology patentability in the United States. And, I mean, to the tune of hundreds of millions of bucks, Apple in the United States told them no. So, anyway, you're going to need to patent something. <clears throat> uh, to get a patent in the United States, you have to have several things qualify for your device. It needs to be novel, which is just new. It needs to be something that doesn't currently exist. Now, that's sort of like the obvious one. I got it. It also has to be non-obvious. Patent attorneys, when you talk to them, wax poetic about non-obviousness and what it all means. And there's a certain way that non-obviousness reads in the United States literature and a certain way that it reads in European literature. But here's an illustration of non-obvious. Well, non-obviousness, it can't be something that would be obvious to an expert in the same field. An example. Uh, pencils have erasers on the end of them. Uh, but I invent a mechanical pencil, and then uh, Dr. Markowski invents a mechanical pencil with an eraser. Well, I mean, that's really obvious. That wouldn't fly. Another example is uh, hot dog buns and mustard. They should go together, and we should make mustard-flavored hot dog buns patent that. That's that's really obvious, and so that wouldn't be patentable. But something else that's a slight change is here's something that is non-obvious. So in a juicer, you can take your vegetables, and it grinds them down into hardly anything, and then spins them around, and the juice is extracted, and all the bits are kept. Well, for a long time, the juice wall, I mean, the spinner's walls were flat. And what would happen is the flat walls would the little particles would stick into the holes and then juice would never get extracted. But if you change the flat walls to something that's at an angle like this, then the bits go up and the juice goes down and it comes out. A very seemingly obvious change, but something that made a humongous difference in the way juice is extracted, I guess, and was a very non-obvious change in the way that got patented. So very little things. This is for y'all. Little things that you're going to walk by and say, boy, that's not very efficient. Look at that. I don't really, I, there's a better way to do that. Draw it out. Think about it and, and run it by some friends and see, hmm, does this make sense to you? Because y'all are going to invent something awesome. It's going to happen. The thing has to be useful. You cannot invent armor against nuclear missiles. I mean, uh, that's a, like a, a really extreme example, but things have to be useful. Uh, the patent office gets tons of applications a year for like science fiction type of things like that. They have to reject them, but it costs a lot of money in the United States actually for them not to reject that. And then finally, your claims. The claims are the legal speak within a document that you are going to then patent uh, that describes what your do what your thing can or cannot do. Now, obviously, you want the claims to be as broad as possible. If you invent uh, a new kind of IV catheter, you would love for the claim to say, uh, and this catheter can be any size and any shape and go into any vessel ever. Because then, if anybody kind of tries to go around you and invent something else that's a certain nuance that's actually non-obvious, your claims protect you from that. The broader the claims, the better your patent, the more you can sell it for, the more it can be protected. The Palma stint was incredibly broad. Nothing had happened like that really ever. There's subsequently like hundreds and hundreds, if not thousands of patents changing that stint, but he owned, 
he owned the most of it. So claims are very, very important. All this is done by a patent attorney. You must hire a patent attorney. There is books out there that say patent it yourself. Good luck to you. You can do that. You can patent things yourself and it costs roughly a thousand bucks. Or you can pay 10,000 to a patent attorney and actually have it get through the system and be successful at it. Don't get me wrong, you will read stuff on the internet about people who did patent it themselves. It's incredibly difficult to do. Almost impossible if you're not versed in the field. It's like being your own tax attorney. Good luck. So on your own, it's between ten and twenty thousand dollars out of your pockets for any do that. Or you can do it through Utusca. Uh, and I don't know why we're here, I'll tell you how to do that. And we get so intellectual property here. <clears throat> if you're an employee, a student, or anyone who works here and you come up with an idea that has something to do with your job, you have to disclose it to the university. You have to tell them, hey, I invented this thing. And then they still can say, here, Dr. Palmas, no thanks. It, I don't really think that's going to go anywhere. It can happen. It actually happened to one of our pulmonologists here. Uh, went through this process, invented uh, a catheter with uh, something on the end of it, and they told him, no thank you. He subsequently uh, formed his own company, and they're uh, going through the FDA to get it approved. But you must disclose uh, what you invented. Okay, so maybe not as much of a black eye all of a sudden. Um, so the way they do that is they actually developed what's called the South Texas Technology Management Office. And they exist in an office by the CTRC. They manage all of the intellectual property that comes through University of Texas Health Science Center as well as University of Texas San Antonio. Now that's actually changing. UTSA is getting their own. But the broad strokes is they are, they exist for nothing else than to take your ideas. You sketch them out on a piece of paper and you call them. And they have helpful people who will say, okay, George, great. Here is a link that I want you to log on to, fill out this form and give it to us. And then they run it through a panel of their people there to see how patentable it is or not. Find experts in the field who say, hey, what do you think about this? And they say yes or no. And then they give you uh, a go on patenting something and they take care of it all. All that 10 or 20,000 bucks, they suck up. They hire an attorney in Austin, actually, who does this for them. But uh, an entire office of people, I don't know how many people exist over there, 20 maybe, who exist for nothing else than to help you invent something. You have to disclose it to them, go to them, and they will help you. Uh, I was going to send my slides, but they're like six megabytes. Uh, I guess I can send this one slide to Eileen and she can give it to everyone in here. If you ever wanted links to the STTM, it's on there. You can also go to Utusca's website and try to navigate to it. It's kind of hard. Uh, they also have their invention disclosure form, that thing that I'm telling you that they will tell you to fill out. Uh, but here's their phone number. If you want to take an iPhone picture of it, I'll leave it up for just a second or not. So how much do you get? Uh, University, so at UTSA, uh, folks there get 50%. The university gets 50%. Here, the inventor gets 40%, and the university gets 60 And actually, I was talking to Dr. Dent last week, and I was under the impression that the university got 50 and the department got 10 But that's not true. It, it is true that the department gets like almost 30% of the royalties that you would end up getting. And the reason they did it this way, 60-40, and a portion going to the department, is because they want to encourage departments to encourage their people to invent stuff. They want to say, oh yeah, Dr. Srinik, sure, you invented something that lights up and we're going to stick it in people and take out appendices and you want to go to Minnesota? I'll pay for that. Yeah, go there and talk to those guys and see if you can work it out with them. But that's what they want to happen. They want the next big invention to come from this place. Inventors here get 40%. I mean, don't get depressed. If you get a million dollars, you can keep 400,000 of it. It's better than nothing of it. Inventions die before they even get jotted down on a napkin. 
mention that you didn't jot it down on a napkin? I bet you do. Someone raised their hand. Ben did. This is uh, Jack Pacey sent me a picture. It's in his garage. He builds stuff. There are other things. Too. This is where he built that retractor, actually. But prototypes being built, that's another thing altogether. Now, he's a big fan of, you must make a prototype. If you don't have a prototype, I mean, what are you going to do? However, it depends on what that thing is. Sometimes prototypes are, like, really, really difficult to make. And you may not have the ability to really do that. You can draw something out and think about it, and you know what you're seeing, because I work with these tubes every day. But you don't know how to make stuff. You don't know how to do things with plastic or have a workshop in your garage. And so sometimes prototypes being money. Actually, if you're going to pay somebody to make a prototype for you, it can cost up to 100 grand. Actually, the university knows this. And throughout the university system, this year, they are starting to fund things up to about $100,000 to make prototypes. It's a brand new thing that they have. <clears throat> you can find investors, and then you need to sell the idea to someone who can do it. So get some money to find some help. These are obvious choices. All of these have turned me down, by the way, everyone. I'll just leave this slide up here for them. Boston Scientific doesn't make its way up there because they're still on the hook. But actually, the people who aren't on this slide are the people that are most likely to help you. In the city of San Antonio alone, there are three medical innovation companies that do nothing but find ideas to invest money in. And these are people you've never heard of before. All they do is look around for some medical student who invented some new way of doing this and that, and they may take your idea give you a cut of whatever they're going to get a cut of and pay you lots of money, and they pay lots of money to get prototypes made and move it through the system. It's actually an innovative way of thinking about innovation. These exist all over the country. Uh, in fact, the Hunts in Dallas, uh, one of the matriarchs there donated $150 million to a company to do nothing but that, and they make their way through all the major universities in Texas, looking for stuff to dump their money into. But serendipity has something to do with it. So this is the same picture of Dr. Pacey looking under the heart in a pig. The picture on your right screen's left is a picture of someone doing a difficult airway. They're doing a fiber optic scope. You see the person's tongue hanging out of there. It's very difficult. Pacey was in an operation one day and it, he said it was 28 minutes of anesthesia, like the best anesthesiologist in his building, struggling to get an airway. They tried every little thing, and he's looking at them, and he's looking at his retractor with the light on it, and he's looking at them, and he's looking at his retractor, and he says, I think I have a tool for this. And he developed, uh, yeah, <clears throat> He developed a, a way of looking at the larynx through uh, a video scope that you don't have to white balance and you can just sort of turn it on. It's what we call the glide scope. His company was not Verathon. His company was Saturn. In fact, on the back of our glide scope, it'll say Saturn Medical. They were bought by Verathon. And to kind of let you know, Verathon made $100 million last year. 100 with the, with big M billion dollars. And who knows how many lives have been saved to him. Serendipity kind of happened. He wasn't thinking about airway. He wanted to do appendectomies in the emergency department. Yet he's standing there and something bad is happening and he puts these two things together. Lunch between silver and fry became the post-it note. Which brings us back to Ferris. <clears throat> so really what John Hughes did uh, whether we were conscious of it or not, but he affected the way an entire generation of people thought about parenting. He, he, he did it... He did it uh, in, a, in a way that none of us are real conscious of, but now that I'm telling you about it, you probably don't want to treat your kids that way. And he did it, uh, and it made its way through not just one generation, but several generations of people. And really, that's what's going to happen with medical innovation. 
uh, it's not going to be long before at poster presentations, at big medical meetings, there's probably going to be what's going to start out as a tiny section of, this is the cool thing we invented at University of Minnesota this year. This is the cool thing that we invented at Utesca in our critical care department. At the SECM, it's going to be over there in the section of people who invent stuff. And the next thing you know, that's going to carry to the podium. And the next thing you know, it's going to carry to an entire big section of things. It's the future of medicine. It's the future of making money in medicine for sure. Other institutions uh, have taken uh, even a more progressive approach than the, what we do. Uh, we will pay for your patent and take care of the attorney's fees. We got it. Uh, it. Really, you have to have an idea that's pretty rudimentary for them to do it. I mean, it's, they're really good at it. But the machine to be able to build something, like within the university, to take that idea, take it to... Is it me that's moving? What am I moving on? take it to market, take it to an engineer and make a prototype, we do not have a mechanism for that. We also don't have a built-in mechanism for plugging us into major corporations like all those ones that I showed on that slide and immediately getting millions of dollars from them to do whatever it is we want. We don't have that mechanism. Places like Harvard, the Wies Institute, is a bioinnovation institute at Harvard that is Harvard's single biggest donor to date. $125 million was given by one guy just so they can invent medical innovation stuff. Stanford Biodesign, if you go to their website, it's really cool. In fact, their co-founder is the chairman of surgery at Stanford. Great guy. He and them do nothing but what I just told you. Take your idea, turn it into something that's patentable and protectable, and then make prototypes and make something better. And they go everywhere from tiny little connectors to robotic surgery, little robots that they're going to let fly into your vessels and do all kinds of craziness. But they do that. Northwestern just added an institution. Hopkins has had one for a while. This picture is Art Erdman. He's at the University of Minnesota. In fact, they have the only annual running, and I think this is the second year they're doing it, but it's not me. It's Covarubius. They have the only annual meeting for bioinnovation, and in, really anybody can get into it because hardly anybody goes to it. But it's starting off, and he's really excited about it. Maybe we'll have that one day. <clears throat> so this is Pacey's parting comments when I'm interviewing him on the phone. He says, Open your eyes and look around. Keep your mind and your eyes open. All the possibilities around you. He's a really excited guy and he wants innovation to become part of our everyday life. And then it made me think of Ferris. I mean, this is one of the best quotes in the 1980s. I'm sorry, it's not me. Okay, I'm done. I thought that was going to be boring. No, sorry. I argued with Stuart. Um, <laughs> when you go to that office in the university, do you sign a contract then? No. Out of pure paranoia, they're going to a committee with your idea, so you haven't signed anything to protect it? No. They, so, uh, no. None of them must be from Chicago. No, they, they, so they exist under a certain kind of protection, and your idea exists under a certain kind of protection because it belongs to the University of Texas. Like, the giant organization standpoint of it uh, is something that sort of protects you and protects them a little bit. But Thank you're you. right. I mean, you could theoretically disclose your idea to one of the workers there and then just take it. They haven't done it. Go out, protects you from them. Yeah. And they've all signed things saying that they will not steal. Yeah, yeah so. and these people are like appropriately vetted. Yeah. Yeah. The pre-story about Paul Maas is that he was actually on the faculty with Stu Reuter in Monterey, uh, California. And when Dr. Reuter got recruited uh, to become the chair of radiology here, he brought Paul Maas with him. Uh, he used the Department of Surgery's animal facility downstairs 
uh, on a daily basis. And, uh, and, and that's why it was so ludicrous that the university actually passed up this uh, phenomenon. But a lot of things have happened like that. Um, I'm trying to think of the name of the pediatric surgeon who was in Russia and saw the staple guns. Rubbish. Dr. Ravage, bushy eyebrows, should not have forgotten. And uh, he uh, asked the Russians, where do they get these staple guns from? They said, eh, we got this little guy down the block there making these. So somehow, Dr. Ravage never told us exactly how he got them out of Russia. We all accused him it was in a body cavity. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> that poor little guy in Russia never got any of the credits then. That was U.S. Surgical, you know, with the whole start of that thing, so. Any other questions? Dr. Ramos. Uh, fascinating talk. Uh, very much enjoyed. The, uh, uh, do you have any idea when innovation stops? Uh, you know, the, you get an age like uh, your man to death, that <laughs> innovation stops and you don't have that. They say it used to be the common sense that innovation occurs in the first 30 years of life and then goes away. Is that true? I think that if you have to ask yourself, is innovation gone in me? It probably is. <laughs> <laughs> you could be young and still have an original thought to die a lonely death in your head, Dr. Robbins. One of the... <laughs> Personally, <laughs> one of the uh, in, in most interesting inventions that uh, one of my patent attorneys worked with was a guy who invented uh, a certain action cap gun for his grandkid in East Texas. And this cap gun, the I, I don't know much about actions on guns, but the action that he put on this gun was something that his grandkid could do really fast or do really fast a bunch of times. I couldn't really, I, I didn't really understand it, but. <laughs> He invented this thing and, and just as a cap gun. Smith & Wesson bought it from him for 10 million cold, straight up. This is in 1990s money. And they shelved it because uh, they, they invented something that is kind of similar but not non-obvious enough that he couldn't patent it. And they didn't want Browning or whoever to get a hold of it. So they paid him $10 million for it. And he was a granddad, so I don't know. Maybe he could have been a 30-year-old granddad. <laughs> <laughs> IBM uh, houses, so if you invent something for IBM, you, IBM owns it. It doesn't matter if you invent a new kind of condom or a new kind of lawnmower blade. In your garage, if you work for IBM, they own it. They have a repository of over 200,000 patents over the years that they just own. And you can go to them, like, and they don't disclose what they are or anything. You have to kind of think of something, and then you're like, oh, look at that. And you'll do a patent search, and they'll say, oh, yeah, look, that person invented that very thing. And you go look, and well, who you call him on the phone, I did this. Where, where's your patent? Oh, yeah, I work for IBM. They have it in the repository. And then you call IBM, and they say, give me a couple hundred thousand dollars, you can have it. That's one of the things that the lawyers do, right? They search to, to make sure... Yeah, but you with know, the internet, you really can do it too. new and not been done before. Right. If you get vetted through our SDTM, it's not been done. Dr. Shireman. That was a wonderful talk. I truly appreciate it. There's a lot of actually things going on at UT System that is actually trying to encourage what you're talking about. There have been a couple of attempts through the VPRs, well, one attempt to the VPR office to establish an incubator, which is exactly where that line comes where you have that idea you put the patent in, but you can't make it. And so the UTSA has the Roadrunner incubator that does exactly that. And they're actually very willing to try to work with us. They have engineers. They have business students. And it's good for not only innovation, but it's good for their education to have the business students help you make a business plan, as well as the engineers help you make the design. And there's actually competition that has started to become yearly where students can actually have an idea, and they'll get some seed money. Um, Patty Hearn, who works with um, Chancellor Shine, Vice Chancellor Shine, is putting together an initiative called Fresh Air, where we're bringing in industry, not only drugs and pharmaceuticals, but also device companies. And that's going to be in Austin in September 26th. I'm on the internal advisory board. And so we're looking for speakers. 
to represent San Antonio, but other aspects of the UT system, to try to say, look, within the system, we have a lot of intellectual capital, we have a lot of ideas, we have a lot of infrastructure to support it, we have patients that you can do clinical trials on, what do you want industry, what can we do for you, and what can you do for us? So I think there's a lot of attempts within the system and also locally to try to expand innovation. And I would encourage all of you, there will be a call for abstracts for this fresh air meeting that if you do have ideas or things that you're working on, now this isn't an abstract for a, a surgery meeting. It's, 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 it's a, basically a pitch, if you will, to try to get a company interested in something that you're doing. So once again, thanks for bringing this to everyone's attention. Departments of surgery are exactly incubators for innovation, usually with engineering departments for devices. And we could be on a forefront with that, especially with perhaps the system behind us. Actually, the forerunner of Lipitor was actually cimetidine. Uh, in 1975, I believe when it came out, it, uh, Smith Klein French was about ready to go bankrupt. And their uh, guys made like 150 structural modifications, thinking they protected it. And then a few years later, ranitidine came out. They had obviously missed one. Dr. Schlesinger. Just briefly, to underscore the importance of going through the system, uh, Dr. Palmaz, when he uh, introduced the concept of uh, the stent, uh, shortly thereafter was sued by one of his technicians alleging that he had been so active in the development of it that he deserved a portion of the patent right. So, I mean, it isn't, there, there are lots of traps uh, that you can help protect yourself against by uh, early on uh, using the, the system. Yeah, that, that's actually a really great point. In fact, most people don't like to talk about money in general, but it's best to talk about money like up front, like right in your face. And so one of the lessons I've learned with dealing with uh, inventions through here and engineers that have experience in it is let's say you and I talk about an idea today. I'll look at you right in the face and say, okay, do you want half of this? Do you want me to walk away from it at all? Or can we just split it 50-50 with us two? You look at me in the eye, I say yes, I say yes, and it's 50-50. See, when things like that happen, and then also it, that gets all written down. But if you deal with it up front, then there's no problems. When you go to STTM, you say, yes, me and Dr. Swesser did it. And it gets sorted out at the very, very beginning. Sorted out at the very beginning. <laughs> well, yeah. well, probably um, everybody's heard my story. I hate KCI. Uh, we had the uh, opportunity to invest in a rotating bed when we were at the burn unit. Uh, one of our nephrologists, knew a nephrologist doing this, and we said, nah. So that became KCI. They didn't put up that 20-story building at uh, Callahan and I-10 and tore down one of my favorite restaurants. Um, and then they came up with the wound vac, and that's why I want to really bring this up, because we all were doing something similar to wound vac. We were using Curlex. We were using suction catheters, and we were putting a vidrape on it. The only thing we missed was somebody to think about it was to use those sponges and somebody develop one of those little portable uh, suction machines. And so, you know, it's like you said, uh, you're just uh, one little idea away from uh, coming away with uh, the grand prize. I also have to write ride past Dr. Lodiger's estate every morning, uh, the guy who started uh, KCI. So we haven't firebombed it yet. <laughs> Any other questions? All right. <laughs>